energy conversion research for about 20 years, uh, specifically related to uh, direct conversion of radioactive decay into electricity. Uh, my, my latest project and the reason I've, uh, I've stepped forward here at the moment is, uh, is very exciting. It's a, it's a method for neutralizing radioactive waste. Uh, we, have got, uh, we have gotten experimental verification of this process. Um, and uh, we are laying we are laying the groundwork. Well, I get, actually the groundwork has already been laid uh, uh, for our our public release of this information uh, uh, first of August. Uh, however, since conference was going on this weekend, I thought uh, I'd make a little uh, uh, I'd jump the gun a little bit. Uh, this is a uh, this is a textbook textbook process. We have not developed any new technology. Uh, this is purely applied physics. Uh, but uh, before, I, before I just jump right into that, I'll give you a little, uh, I'll give you a little background of, of where I've come from and, and uh, how I've ended up here. Uh, as I said, my, uh, the brunt of my work for the last, uh, the last 20 years has been conversion of radioactive decay into electricity. Uh, and what we have here in this slide are, are the four basic types of nuclear battery. This, this cell here is, uh, is what's called a primary cell. was first demonstrated by Mosley in 1918. Uh, they've been around a very long time. Uh, they, have, uh, they have limitations in, in efficiency. Uh, the, this second type, this is a secondary cell. This, this device, this is a, a PN junction cell. These saw a lot of use in the, uh, in the six, late 60s, early 70s for uh, powering pacemakers. Uh, this right here, this would be the RTG. That's the nuclear battery of choice uh, of NASA. And of course, I've, I've depicted uh, patent numbers for several, uh, several patents for nuclear batteries. Uh, this, this is a, uh, a a little better depiction of how the uh, PN junction cell worked, the type of device that was being used to power pacemakers. It's, it's, simply, uh, it's simply a, uh, a PN junction, a diode, maybe a transistor. You irradiate it, and uh, electrons migrate across the junction. Uh, those, were, those were applicable in microwatt powers. This was, uh, this was my, my first work with, uh, with nuclear batteries was a contact potential cell uh, of the gas type. Uh, there are limitations with the efficiency and, and we abandoned that design uh, very quickly. It was not a, uh, a marketable device. But anyway, what I did is, is looking at all the, all the conversion technologies available, I reduced them all to the same common denominator. And that's what we have here. And regardless of the design, all the known uh, conversion methods for, for converting radioactive decay into electricity involve some source of potential. Uh, so the potential difference is applied. And uh, whether it's alpha, beta, gamma, it doesn't matter what type of radiation uh, is brought into the system. But the, the radiation produces ionizing effects. Uh, and then the ions are separated by the electric potential applied uh, uh, and collection of collection of those charges uh, will give up give up their power into a load so from there uh, from there we uh, we proceeded to build uh, nuclear batteries here I have uh, this is a, this is a 75 watt unit and and a, f and, uh, a 50 watt unit that we were testing uh, with one of my previous companies uh, these are all nuclear batteries from, from very small to very large, uh, multi-kilowatt units and uh, uh, tens of watt. Well, this is tens of watts. This is more of a five-watt unit. One of the pat this was my first patent uh, uh, for an energy conversion system, a, a nuclear battery. Uh, this is the basic circuit for the 75-watt uh, the cell I showed earlier. Now this is, uh, this is the basic layout for a, a thin film contact potential device. It's solid state, produces pure DC. Uh, uh, the, 
the radioisotope used is tritium, which is, uh, which is almost benign in a biological system. The beta decay is only 5 keV average. Uh, and we are currently we are currently producing these uh, these tritium thin film cells uh, in Denver. The company is uh, called Particle Power Systems. This is a, this is an earlier prototype here, just uh, just up next to a standard D cell to give you an idea of size. But this is this is a five watt device, uh, continuous output uh, with a ten year working life. Continuous output day and night, uh, every hour of every day. Uh, of course, of course, working with radio radioactive materials requires uh, special handling equipment. In this case, this room uh, is a sealed steel room uh, with its own uh, air ventilation. Uh, this is an interior view of the room. We see glove boxes, uh, isotopic analysis stations. Um, again, just uh, just inside the room, I uh, just you know we have a lot of we have a lot of. Uh, Builders here, people who uh, who go home and try these things, and I, I definitely do not recommend that you do that. I'm I'm pointing out that we have uh, we have material that that most of you do not have, and I, I don't recommend anybody uh, anybody tinker with radioactive materials. Just some uh, shots around the lab. Uh, this is this is the old lab. This is the uh, the old isotopic research facility in in Oregon. Uh, this is, now I'm up to uh, our new facility in Denver. This is just my office. Uh, this is a, a HEPA filter. It's, you'll see uh, the equipment that it's connected to, but this HEPA, fil HEPA filter filters out uh, the radioactive materials before they're allowed to, to uh, exit the building and become effluents. Uh, this is a sputter chamber. This is the device I'm using to make the thin film batteries. Again, uh, the tritium batteries as we call them. Um, another uh, another shot of the uh, of the sputter chamber is actually in operation. If you look at the port, uh, didn't come through very well in this uh, this slide. Uh, the sputter chamber is open here. This is uh, this is a substrate heater. It's an RF heated device. Uh, the rings uh, in this case this is a silicon this is a silicon uh, target, and uh, the rings are from silicon atoms that have actually been driven off of this. Uh, into this other chamber that's that you know, we can look here. Uh, so inside the other half of the chamber, this is this is your substrate heater. Uh, if you know anything about uh, ion sputtering, uh, the, the quality control is performed with heat, or by controlling the heat. And again, this is uh, just an operation. This is some shots around the lab. Um, that was just uh, these are UPSs. Uh, this is a, uh, a high-frequency rectifier, some uh, assorted power supplies. Um, again, some more shots around the lab, uh, isotopic analysis station. Now we're getting to uh, some of the uh, equipment relative to, uh, to what I'm working on now. Um, this, is, uh, this is an electron microscope. This is the uh, this is a piece of equipment that we're using for the experiments that uh, that I'm here to talk about at the moment. Uh, in this in this piece of equipment, we're able to treat uh, one cubic centimeter of of material at a time. Uh, and the company uh, the company that I'm that we're doing this with this is uh, this is Nuclear Solutions. It's a limited liability corporation in or pardon me company in uh, Denver. And uh, in Nuclear Solutions, LLC has developed a, a process for neutralizing radioactive waste products whereby gamma radiation is used to induce nuclear transformations that change the normal half-life of radioisotopes, usually measured in years to thousands of years, to a half-life measured in days. <clears throat> this means that the radioactive waste products decay into non-radioactive stable elements in a matter of days rather than thousands of years. For example, plutonium-239 has a half-life of 24,300 years. After treatment with this equipment, uh, it has a half-life of 45 days. Uh, this allowing plutonium to go through, uh, well, any of the isotopes, they have to go through 10 half-lives before they become stable or non-radioactive. 
so that means in this case uh, for plutonium that uh, it takes 465 days to become stable rather than 240,000 years. Cesium-137 has a half-life of 13 days after the treatment uh, and becomes barium. Uh, strontium-90 uh, becomes stable immediately after treatment. Uh, it's, it's not radioactive when it comes out of, when it comes out of the machine. The half-life the half is only 25 seconds. Uh, we can even use this process for, uh, for enrichment of uranium to provide reactor fuel. That is, we can, we can enrich uranium-238 to uranium-235. Prior to treatment of the radioactive materials, uh, they must be separated by well-known chemical processes. Uh, the quantity of material that can be treated in one process depends upon the size of the machine. As an example, uh, we expect to, uh, we expect that a transportable device will be capable of processing over a ton of material a day. Uh, the, the transportable device is small enough that it will fit into a 20-foot truck, uh, so, so treatment plants can be set up at a nuclear power plant, or device can actually be, uh, be brought to the, the nuclear waste dump sites. Uh, this eliminates the need to ship this radioactive waste all over the country. Uh, of course, uh, permanent installations can uh, also be built at the site of every nuclear power plant to eliminate the need of transporting this waste. And, uh, and of course, uh, after treatment, we've, we've reduced uh, the storage time, so long-term storage is not, no longer an issue. Uh, after treatment, the isotope must still be stored for a period of 10 of its new half-lives, but there are no byproducts from the process other than heat uh, during this new half-life period, and at the end of that period, the stable resultant products uh, from the material that was, uh, that was being processed. Uh, there are no materials required for operation of the, other than electricity to run the device. Uh, stock electrical generators are available that convert heat into electricity, and the heat source can be the material that's being treated itself. So because uh, after treatment, uh, these things have such, such a short half-life, they become heat sources. Uh, that, this means that uh, operating costs will be limited to labor and maintenance of the device, making this technology very cost-effective. Uh, this, uh, this, this process uh, does not require any new technology to be invented. Uh, to construct a commercial model. Now, we, we are currently designing uh, an industrial model now, but, uh, but that has not been done yet. Right now, right now it's still uh, laboratory scale. But even, even at that, we're treating uh, one cubic centimeter at a time. Uh, anyway, it is feasible that a, a fully functional uh, industrial-sized device can be uh, put, on, put into operation within six months. So some of the advantages here are uh, uh, we have 100% stabilization through transmutation of these radioactive waste products, uh, which are then allowed to undergo uh, their, their natural radioactive decay uh, to stable or inert products in days rather than thousands of years. This allows uh, site storage until the radioisotope becomes inert. And again, I, I can't stress more uh, that uh, this this really eliminates the need to, to ship this stuff. There's, there, we can move the equipment. We don't have to move the radioactive waste. The uh, the treatment process itself is only a matter of hours. Uh, uh, there are no toxic or hazardous byproducts. Um, the equipment is small enough that it is transportable. Uh, Installations at nuclear power plants means the in, end of uh, transportation and storage of this nuclear waste has a low energy consumption. Um, has been experimentally verified. Uh, patents are pending. We've uh, we filed on that, and uh, it looks really good. That's uh, that's really all I came here to say. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that you could also enrich. Uh, Products? Yes. 
So is it to take the waste and reconvert it back into a usable fuel? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, way, the question was, uh, uh, he wanted clarification because I, I claimed that we can actually enrich products, and the answer is yes. Yes, we can. Uh, one, of the, one of the byproducts that we can make here is reactor-grade fuel. So, in essence, you could take the waste coming out and feed it back into the front end of the unit. That is a... It, 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 in a limited case, the answer is yes. We can uh, we can take some of this material out and put it right back into the reactor's fuel. Uh, but it, in a general sense, uh, the answer is no. Most most of the waste products that come out become stable elements: zirconium, uh, uh, xenon. There, uh, so they they cannot be used as fuel. Absolutely. So I have to ask, how does it work? Well, uh, beyond beyond the uh, the explanation I've given, I can't say because uh, we have filed for patents, and if I give a a full technical disclosure, then uh, then basically I've made it public information and forfeited my patent rights. Um, I, for me, the the rub is is that I. I really hate people to get up and say, yeah, we've got this great thing, uh, but it's proprietary. I can't tell you about it. In this case, I'm so excited about what we're doing uh, that I just, I just can't be quiet. I, uh, I had to tell somebody. And uh, that's part of the reason, uh, part of the reason for me uh, making the presentation today is that uh, I, I can't wait till August 1st. Paul, I have a question. Normal transportation paths <clears throat> on the known, on the current transportation of uh, radioactive elements that are known are normally down two, up one, down two, up one. Does this follow the same uh, path? Well, by uh, down two, up one, you're elements talking Elements going down to when it goes from. You're, you're talking about from natural radioactive decay. If yes. It, by down two, you mean uh, you're referring to alpha decay? Yes. Da it goes down two elements and back up one, down two. Up one. That is a that is a that is a decay process, and granted, uh, decay does cause transmutation because because when a when an atom emits a part of its nucleus, it's, it's not the same material afterwards. So right. uh, so I will agree. But but the process we're doing, what we're doing, is we are using we are using uh, we are using a technique of beam irradiation. Mm to to induce nuclear reactions right. and through the emission of particles from the nucleus there is there is a transmutation but uh, but we're we're using it we're actually doing a uh, an inducement of nuclear reactions by putting energy into the nucleus right. however see that when I when I make that statement it sounds like uh, it sounds like we're talking about uh, the Stanford linear accelerator and that's uh, that's not the case. We're only we're only using about 70 watts per hour for a one hour period to irradiate uh, a cubic a full cubic centimeter of material. So uh, uh, the beam is as a matter of fact the beam intensity is uh, the beam intensity is on the order of 10 to the 15th. I'll call them 10 to the 15th uh, particles uh, per square centimeter per second. And that's not very high. It's not very high. No, um, well, m the question I had was, can you control at which point, I mean, there's a, all radioactive elements start at one point and they end here, if you take it to its full completion. Correct. Can you control at what point, can you control which element that comes out? That's, that's my question. Only if, uh, only if prior to the treatment, we we look at what its natural decay cycle is, because we it is a transmutation process. Like I say, we are using uh, we are using using an induced nuclear reaction to transmute the element, and in this case, we're just transmuting it from one radioisotope to another. So all we're doing is is we're transmuting from a long half life or a long lived radioisotope to an isotope with a short half life. After we've done that, we just set it aside and let it do its natural thing, only it's done in a matter of days rather than thousands of years. Okay, so, so when you're finished, it isn't radioactive any longer. It doesn't throw any, any particles out then? 
after it's gone through, say, 10 of its half-lives. Right. It, it depends on which isotope. See, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. strontium-90 after treatment is, is stable. There's, there's no radioactivity before we can get it out of the machine. Got it. Uh, cesium, on the other hand, uh, take, it'll take uh, 130 days before, it's, before there's no more signs of radioactivity. With uranium, your, the, the natural decay brings it to lead. Correct. Um, but it goes through like six different elements, up, down two, up one, down two, up one. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so or, you're, or maybe more than that. It's, well, it's yeah. a bunch of them. Yeah. A bunch of them, anyway. Um, can, you, can you produce, this is a stupid question, but there, I guess there aren't any stupid questions. Have you been able to produce any precious elements? I mean, we're talking about lead only being two away from precious metal. Uh, I, uh, the answer is no. I'll, I'll just interrupt. There's, uh, okay. we've, we've not, uh, we've not looked at, uh, alchemy. We're not, we're not trying to produce precious metals. Uh, well, I mean, you know, if lead I, were value. <laughs> I, to be honest with you, I haven't even, uh, I haven't even looked to see whether it's possible with our process. I, I don't even know. Isn't it just choosing the right, uh, radioactive element to start with that determines that? You're absolutely right. Uh, our focus, what we've done, is we've looked at the constituents of radioactive waste, and uh, if if you if you look at radioactive waste, the the two primary isotopes that are of a problem that are a problem for burial because they generate heat are cesium-137 and strontium-90. Uh, so we specifically focused on those. The other, uh, the other concerns in radioactive waste are the biological health hazards. And long-term storage of radioactive waste, uh, you pose the risk of, of these isotopes getting in, in the groundwater supply. Well, if in that event, the two major concerns are technetium-99 and uh, iodine-129. So, so we have focused on those as radioactive waste products of primary interest because they are the primary concerns. Uh, from a strategic standpoint, we've also addressed uh, plutonium-239 because, uh, because it being a fissile material and, and its application to the bomb, there are, well, for instance, at, uh, at Rocky Flats, they're spending five, pardon me, not five, at Rocky Flats, they're currently spending $50 million a year just to guard this stuff. That's that's how much they're paying Wacken Hut to run security guards around protecting this stuff. With our, uh, with our process, it's not plutonium-239 anymore, it's not fissile, and they don't need all the guards. Yes? Uh, Nuclear Solutions, it's a limited liability company in uh, Denver, Colorado. That's no. what I was gonna ask. We are a, uh, we are a private company um, at this time, we don't have any plans of going public. Uh, the reason, uh, the reason we are making the public announcements are really just to let people know that, uh, hey, somebody has found a solution and we're working on it. We're currently negotiating contracts with, uh, they're not done, so I probably can't say who we're negotiating with, but, but we are currently, uh, we are currently working on the, on the problem and we have a real, a real system. This isn't. Uh, this isn't. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who claim they've got, they've got methods for transmutation, and but they're the only ones who can make it happen. And it's never. This is real. This stuff is. I'm up here telling you about textbook science. This is. This is ironclad. It's been verified. Um, we don't have to develop anything new. All we have to do is go out and build equipment and, and apply the knowledge that, that we already have. This is strictly applied physics, applied engineering. That's it. Uh, thank you.